make sure that your equipment is all in order and you have the right equip equipment because you don't have time once you start mixing the material to, to stop and go back and uh, uh, hunt for your equipment with it. So what you're going to need is you're going to need your roller board and for trays we use the thick side of the roller board. So you want to make sure that you have, are using the thick side. You're going to need the roller for it. You will need a good knife. You will need something to mix the material with, a tongue blade. You will need something to lubricate your roller and roller board, and we usually use Vaseline for that. Now for crown and bridge trays, you don't want to use Vaseline on it, so you have to do that with use of something like water as a separator so that your material doesn't stick. And I usually use a glass slab when I'm making a crown and bridge tray rather than a wooden roller board. But for complete denture trays, we can use the wooden roller board using the thick side of it and Vaseline onto the, the roller board and the roller. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a coat of Vaseline onto the roller board on the thick side and be about nice and liberal with your Vaseline on it. And whatever you have left over on your fingers, lubricate the roller itself till it's nice and lubricated. Once you're through with that, I used to take the excess Vaseline and wipe it onto my fingers. That keeps the material from sticking to my, to my hands. And we can set that aside and we're going to use a paper cup. The material that we're using is Bosworth's Fast Tray. And what you're going to find with Fast Tray is first of all the measuring devices that they give you for it, which is a small glass vial for the monomer. That if you use that glass vial with the monomer and exactly one scoop, leveled off scoop of the polymer, uh, you'll find that your material is a little dry. So what we're going to do is we're going to use one glass vial of the monomer and then we're going to use a little less than a full scoop of the uh, polymer so that we don't end up with the material that's too dry. So what I like to do with it is I will measure off the monomer, one full measure of the monomer into make sure it is a waxed paper cup and not a plastic cup. And then once you have that then we're going to measure one scoop of the polymer and take a little extra out so that it is not quite full so that we'll end up with a mix that we can work with rather than one that's too dry. And dump the polymer into the monomer and mix the material until all of that polymer is thoroughly wet and there's no dry powder left in it. So thoroughly mix the material and usually it's going to take you about 30 seconds to really get that material well mixed. So it's a nice little wetted mass and no dry powder in it. About like so. Once you get it to that, that state, I like to pinch the top of the cup and just leave it sitting for about, oh, maybe 20 seconds, 25 seconds and allow that material to start reaching what is known as a gel state. The material goes through a uh, powder uh, and monomer mixed, just wetted state. It goes from that into a gel state and from the gel state it will polymerize into a hardened material. The, ma the state at which you can work with that material is the gel state. So let's see after 15 or 20 seconds what sort of condition our material is in. It's not bad. It's in pretty good shape. So I usually gather it up in the bottom of the cup and your material will come out in a mass like so. And I know that it's ready that I can work with it. When I can take the material into my hands, it doesn't stick to my hands, and I can knead the material. In other words, fold it over on itself several times and work the material, and it will become into a nice homogeneous mass. And once you get it into that kneading or gel state, lay it on the roller board, and with the roller, we're going to roll it out to the thickness or maybe just slightly thicker, you can leave it just slightly thicker if you want to, than the thickness that that roller board will allow you to get with it. And we're going to do one tray at a time. This time I'll work on the upper. Once you have it rolled out, take a knife and just lift the edge of it. Once you have the edge of it lifted like so, then you can peel it off of the roller board. And if you work with this material, you can do it in such a manner that you don't get a lot of wrinkles in it. And that's what I look for, is try to get as few wrinkles in it as we can at this state. 
lay it over the cast, and I like to lift the back of it up, back with the posterior border of it, and work it down with my thumb into the pallet and work any air that I've trapped in there, work that out the back. Once you've done that, and you've worked it out the back, it's nice adapted to the nice and adapted to the pallet. Take a finger and adapt the material down into the periphery. Make sure it's adapted well down into the periphery and not standing away from the cast. Now you can see that by adapting it that way, we end up with a nice smooth surface to it, no wrinkles. Now we can cut the excess material off. And I'm purposely going to cut it off, still making sure that I leave it long. So we can take a knife, cut the excess material off of it, and we can do the same around the buckle, all the way around, get rid of all this excess, purposely leaving it a little long at this point because we're going to be trimming it up with a burr and a rotary instrument here in a few minutes after it's set all the way and after we get a handle on it. But that material should be about like so, and you notice it's nice and smooth without wrinkles, and it doesn't need polishing if you do it this way. And if you get it, wait till it reaches just the right consistency to work with it, then, you, then it doesn't need to be polished. And notice we did not add extra monomer to it to smooth it out like I see some of you do. All that does is ruin the properties of your tray and develops for you an allergy. So do not pour extra monomer on it to smooth it out. Just leave it like so. Now we can set that aside at this point, and I'm going to be adding a handle to this, but I'm going to be adding the handle to both the upper and the lower with a third mix. In other words, I'll make one mix for the upper, one for the lower for the base plates, and then with the third mix, I will add handles to both upper and the lower. So we'll set that aside, and we're going to go through the same procedure now in adapting it for the lower. We'll start that out. I first of all, use of a little Vaseline, re-Vaseline the board and our roller. And with a fresh paper cup now, we're going to measure one full measure of the monomer. Set the measure aside. full measure of the polymer and remo remove some of the polymer so that we don't end up with a dry mix. Dump the polymer into the monomer and mix until all the material is thoroughly wet and we have no dry spots in the material. So thoroughly mix it and it'll feel sort of grainy to you and sort of dry feel to it right at first and still it goes until it goes into the gel state. Once it gets into that gel state, then it will not feel dry to you. So once we get it thoroughly mixed and, and it wetted, uh, we'll close it up. And now our material should be into the gel state and we can check it and see. And yes, it's in a nice gel state. So we'll get the ball of the material out of there and work it with our fingers, kneading it just like we did with the upper one and knead the material until it's into a nice little homogeneous mass. Place it on a roller board and roll it out to the thickness of the thick side of that roller board. Now in manipulating the material for a lower, you want a horseshoe-like of material. And what we have right now does not have a horseshoe to it. So what I like to do is I like to cut a wedge out of the middle of the material like so, this will allow me to adapt that material to the cast much better than I would without the wedge. Start lifting it from one side, peel the material off of the board. Once you have the material peeled off of the board, then we're going to adapt it to the cast by laying the material onto the cast, making sure that it will cover everything we intended for it to cover. And I usually start with the lingual and just with my finger, adapt it into the lingual, making sure that it goes down well adapted at least as far as I intend for my tray to go. And then come around after you adapt it onto the lingual and adapt it onto the facial surfaces all the way around. 
Once you think you have it fairly well adapted to the cast, then we take the knife, and again, knife trim it, get rid of the excess material, so we won't be all day trying to trim the excess off with the rotary instrument later on. Get rid of the excess material, and we do that all the way around. And once you have that, the buckle of it all off, then we go to the lingual of it. And getting rid of as much of that excess material as is practical at this time. Okay. Now, we have it adapted fairly well. It's down into the periphery as well. It's down into the buckle shelf area well that we talked about using that as the stop so it's not standing away. And that seems to be fairly well adapted now. So we can set that aside and let it finish the polymerization process. Okay, in making a handle for our trays, I usually do both of those at the same time out of one mix. I find that easier than trying to take the scrap material when I first adapt the base or the tray itself to the cast and take the scrap and, and make a handle for it. We're going to measure, and again, a full measure of the material just as we did before, and we're going to mix that. Full measure of monomer, and with the polymer, again, somewhat less than a full measure. Dump the polymer into the monomer, get it thoroughly wet. And as soon as you think you have it totally mixed and no wet spots in it, again, pinch off the top and let it sit. And now I'm going to put a little monomer into a dapping dish, and I'm going to have a brush handy so that when I make my handles, I can attach the handles to the tray without uh, with a, just a little monomer control with a brush. Now we're going to use that little plug of material and make our handle and I generally will start with some material about like so and then work the material with your fingers till it's nice and sort of a square uh, arrangement this way, okay? And about oh a half to three quarters of an inch wide and a half inch long. That's a little bit long, so I'm going to cut some of that material off of there. I don't want quite that much of it. And now I'm going to adapt this to the cast, but before I do that, or to the tray, I'm going to wet the area with a little monomer and wet the surface that I'm going to have hitting that with a little monomer. And we're going to adapt that to our cast, or to the tray that we've already made in the general area where we'd expect the incisors to be. And as I adapt it, I would not only want it to sort of simulate the position of the incisors, but I also want to adapt it in such a way that the handle itself is somewhat uh, indented uh, in the middle of it so that when I, and we're making impressions with this, you can hang on to it. If you get that too smooth, get that handle too smooth and slick or round it off, when you start making impressions, you find you can't hang on to it. So you want it just about like so, and that's not bad for right there. So roughly position, imitate the position of the central incisors. It's about maybe a half inch in height. It's about three quarters of an inch or maybe even a little wider as far as width is concerned. It's going to be somewhat indented on both on the buckle and the lingual so that if you get a hold of it with your fingers, you can hang on to it. You do not want a tray such as you have for making diagnostic cast or even crown and bridge impressions and this sort of thing, you do not want that handle to come forward because if you have that handle coming forward too much, you will not be able to manipulate the lip and place the mucal buckle and mucal labial fold in this correct position. The handle will be in your way and you will have an incorrect impression. So this hand will be about set enough to where we can adapt it. So what we're going to do is we'll fish some material out and I'm going to make a roll of material. It's a little too much material at this point. Probably about this much is what you'd need. And I want to knead the material and I'm going to make it into about the size of a pencil or a little less, or a little more rather, about that size. We're going to take some monomer now and we're going to paint monomer onto the crest of the ridge of that mandibular tray that we've made. 
And now we're going to adapt this handle in such a way that it will be a handle for the anterior part and it's going to be a little sharp uh, ridge of material posteriorly coming up almost into a knife edge. And as it is, I have a little excess material here so I can cut that off. And we're going to build this up into um, posteriorly into a very sharp knife edge like so. You can see knife edge here, knife edge here, and out on the labial parts of it out here, we're going to make it like we did on the maxillary with it indented somewhat in the labial parts so that we can get a hold of it and hang on to it. After the material is set for long enough to complete the polymerization process, and you know that because when the polymerization process is completed, you no longer will feel heat on them. And until that polymerization, while it's still polymerizing, you can still feel heat on them. But when the heat is gone, you're ready to, at that point, to pry them off of the cast. And I usually just take a knife, get under the edge of them, lift them off of the cast, and if you're lucky, it all comes off clean like that. And everything turned out well with that one. We'll do the same with the mandibular one, get it off the cast, and just get under the edge of it and get it to lift up and fine. It came out clean also. Take the cast back and clean the tin foil or the aluminum yeah, tin foil off. Get the tin foil off and remove the wax relief so that we can expose those lines that we drew on there to begin with. We can get rid of that material. Do the same with the lower. Get rid of the, of the relief wax now, just peel it off and expose the lines that we originally drew on the cast. Take the cast back and clean the tin foil or the aluminum, yeah, tin foil off. Get the tin foil off and remove the wax relief so that we can expose those lines that we drew on there to begin with. We can get rid of that material. Do the same with the lower. Get rid of the, of the relief wax now, just peel it off and expose the lines that we originally drew on the cast. These trays, to make them fit the cast and get them back to the line, as you can see, they're too long because we purposely have made them long and now we're going to trim them back to the lines where we originally drew it. What I use for this, there are many tools that can be used for it. You can use your slow speed hand piece with an acrylic burr in it, similar to this one. I like to use the larger one. Or you can use a lathe with an arbor band. Uh, there are many things that you can use to trim them back, but for purposes of what we need to show here, I'm going to use a Dremel tool that I have and a large burr, and this will be about the same as using your slow speed hand piece. And so we're going to get the Dremel tool going well, and we're going to trim these up by getting the rough spots off of them. And as we trim them, fit them back to the cast to see they're approximately where our original line was drawn and across the posterior that's about right and we're going to start to buckle flanges on it by just trimming them back and right now I'm just going to arbitrarily cut some back and we cut some back on this side of the cast and then try it on to the cast and see how close we are. We're still a little long right here. We're about right in the buccal frenum area and we're still long around the labial. So we're going to cut some more off back in the zygomatic arch area. Get it back to the cast and see where we are. And as you can see, we're just about on the line through this area. And we'll come across the labial now doing the same thing. Yes, 
does. And the Dremel tool has a lot more torque than your slow speed hand piece, so this is going much faster than you can, can hope for out of your slow speed hand piece. We're still a little long across the labial, so I want to cut a little more off. Now we have that side cut to where it's just about exactly on the line. We want to continue that around now to the other side and do the same thing. Just arbitrarily cutting some off at this point. Get rid of some of the excess and then we'll fit it to the cast. And as you can see posteriorly, we're not too bad. A little long right in the buckle space area, right there, and then long through most of the anterior part. So we're doing a little bit off back here, not a lot. And then we're going to move up to about here and trim a fair amount more off of it. A little bit long still right in the left central incisor region. So I'm going to just trim a little bit right there. And there we have our tray trim now to the length that we originally outlined with it. You can see it's long here, and it's short here, gets a little longer here, and then a notch for the labial frenum. As you can see, it just about coincides with where we anticipated the length to begin with. Now the lower, a little more trimming usually on the lower, and usually, as we can see here, here's that ledge we talked about, so I need to take a fair amount down right here, and then we're going to have to trim a fair amount off here and here, and then we'll work on the labial with it. So let's start with that now. I'm going to have chips all over everything by the time I'm through. Let's see how we're going now with that length in the front. Just about on the line, so we're fine out there. Now we're going to continue that back. Remember, that was going to pretty well follow a straight line, one plane, starting with that anterior lingual frenum area. And then we're going to bring it all the way back in one plane. at about that length. Now let's go to the other side and do the same thing. Well, no, let's just try it on the cast and see how we're coming. Yes, it's just about exactly to the length that we originally anticipated. Okay? It's just about exactly to that length that we originally anticipated. So let's do the other side now. See how that works out for length now. Just about exactly to the length that we anticipated. Right on to the line. Now I'm going to go to the retromotor pads and we're going to trim it across the retromotor pad and let it drop vertically from the distal of the retromotor pad and round the end of that plane that we just finished grinding of the lingual. And just round it in. about like so. Now if I smooth that a little bit, there's a couple of little knots on it, if I just smooth those out, we will have our form of the lingual flange in that area. Now let's do the same on the other side. Vertically, straight down, 
from the distal of the retromotor pad and then round it in to that original plane that we started with. Let's see how that's fitting now. Just about exactly on it. So that's what we're after at this point. Now we're going to come out to the facial and we're going to look for the external oblique line which we can see coming along right here. And we're going to trim that tray down now for a labial notch or a buckle notch rather where the buckle frenum would be and posteriorly right down to the external oblique line. And from the external oblique line, it will go obliquely into the distal of the retromotor pad. And once you get that, you think you have it to the right, right length, let's put it over onto the cast and see. And we're fine. We're just slightly inside the external oblique line right there. But outside of that, it looks very nice. Now, we're still long across the labial, and we have the other side to go. So we come over to the other side. Set it down to the external oblique line. Let it drift up in the area of the buccal frenum, up closer to the crest of the rig. And let's see how that's going for us. Just a little short right there, but that's fine. It'll work fine when we get to the mouth with it. We cut it just a little too much, right about the first molar area. So we come across the labial now. And anticipate the length we had, which is not very long, so we're going to cut this down a fair amount across the labial. And try it back onto our cast and see where we are. And that's in pretty good shape. We've got one little long spot in the area of the first premolar on the patient's right side and a little bit of a long spot right there with the buckle notch on that side. And there's your tray now, ready for scrubbing up and going to the patient's mouth. Once you've finished trimming your cast, then scrub them up so they're nice and neat and clean. And scrub your cast because you're going to take this to the patient now and the patient's going to see all this so you would like it to be nice and presentable to your patient. You need to inspect your tray and go around the peripheries and make sure that you haven't left any real sharp areas that you might injure your patient with. But I want you to note with these is these trays that with proper handling of the material you do not need to polish them. But I want you to note with these is these trays that with proper handling of the material, you do not need to polish them. You do not need to use pumice on them with a rag wheel. That if you do it properly, the material will turn out nice and smooth and very, very presentable to the patient without having to go to rag wheels and pumice and so on in order to polish them. You do not need to use pumice on them with a rag wheel. That if you do it properly, the material will turn out nice and smooth and very, very presentable to the patient without having to go to rag wheels and pumice and so on in order to polish them.